Okay, hello everybody and welcome to this amazing final presentation session at the Horror Programme at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes, I've been head of the Horror Programme, which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. We've going to be, um, well, we've been investigating institutions uh, and through popular culture, through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. Um, the University of the Underground is a free, pluralistic and transnational university. It was founded in 2017 and it was birthed in the basements of nightlife venues. We're non-profit, we're a reg registered charity. Um, if you'd like to donate, please visit universityoftheunderground.org. On this website, you can find loads of other amazing, exciting programming times and events. All of the lectures and everything that have led to this, the culmination of this amazing work. Um, and there's also going to be link links to all the students' projects on the website there. So I'm going to hand over to Necro to do an, another short introduction on behalf of the students, and then we're going to kick off with some presentations. Thank you so much, Aggie. Hello, all you cats and kittens. It's me, Necro, and my fellow students of the University of the Underground. And we simply cannot wait to show you what we've been working on. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Thank you, Necro. It's a pleasure to hear your voice again. Um, I am Ludovica Battista, and I have been a student and researcher of this horror program. I'm going to share my screen. Please confirm me with your hands. Okay, perfect. So here we go. So my project is called I Am Plant Blind 2. This is not a proper presentation, but this is just to uh, let you know that the research questions that have been moving my research throughout these last four months are how can houseplants and flowers help visualize environmental violence within the dynamics of urban everyday life? And if this visualization can alter uh, successfully human blindness towards vegetal beings and potentially inspire new acts of interspecies care. My project um, has been uh, developed in uh, dialogues with plant owners communities, uh, plant sellers, plant conservation institutions, and um, flower designers, but mainly with the plant lovers and owners communities. And uh, that's the target for um, the output I'm presenting today. The way I'm reaching out to this target is through some very cute-ish uh, plant tags that I have been with a QR code that brings people to the website of the project that I have been um, putting around uh, supermarkets and plant nurseries in my town during the last days. So here we go to our website. So I Am Plant Blind 2 is a confession project. Uh, it's a confession project because um, while researching um, a systemic and structural level of human blindness towards vegetal beings, I have realized that the level where houseplants are confronting us with these issues is a personal one. And I decided to uh, take on the first person narration in order to um, make it uh, easier to establish uh, emotion, the emotional connections and uh, the personal Im imagination that can help uh, visualize these issues. This confession is presented through the form of a video, um, a video where I have been um, reporting my experiments uh, conducted during the last months of uh, human houseplant interactions. Um, and where I am, the one who's confessing um, her own um, blindness and her own uh, issues in uh, seeing um, my impact on environmental violence. And um, 
the kind of um, visuals that this video is displaying are mixing um, this uh, idea of nature and plants as a beautified, objectified, commodified um, thing. And uh, the idea of uh, plants, uh, which is the subverting one that horror through this program has been providing me with, and that I wouldn't have been provided otherwise uh, doing a research like this one, um, by putting houseplants uh, specifically in a position where they are no longer harmless, bloodless, voiceless, headless, all of these characteristics uh, that so frequently uh, plant horror has been uh, providing plants with, and that I have been also providing them with, but um, on the other side of the barricade, on the side where uh, they are not attacking us, but they are um, they are being victims um, of my own um, of my own small acts, and the fact is uh, that in the script of this um, of this confession, in this version you're seeing now, I've taken out my words because otherwise it would have been complicated to present and see the video at the same time in 15 minutes. Um, I am um, I am suggesting that. Um, if the idea is that uh, it's morally impermissible to uh, physically arm plants on an arbitrary level, um, the, 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 the question I'm making is where is this uh, line of the arbitrary drawn? Uh, is arbitrary something that means that I am only decapitating, as it says, it said in an interesting document produced by a Swiss Federal Ethics Committee in 2018? Is it just me decapitating a wild flyder, a flower at the roadside? Uh, or is it also me buying a houseplant uh, without asking myself, where is that houseplant coming from? How did it get there? How was it transported? What kind of chain of actions am I contributing to? with this act, with this uh, vision of this being as a thing. Um, and so these um, visuals try to make very explicit up to a point of uh, maybe being um, obvious, maybe being a bit uh, excessive, uh, these actions of violence uh, against the, the vegetal. Uh, by, as you're seeing, um, making it bleed and um, making it talk afterwards. Um, the thing is, the confession tries to suggest that uh, it's not like if violence isn't seen, it's not present. And um, this visualization of this blood it's it's a metaphor that might suggest that uh, we should uh, that I should in first person this project definitely changed my own way of seeing plants and house plants that I should uh, be um, considering the consequences of my uh, relationship with nature on a broader ecosystem level and the fact that I have been having houseplants and cactuses and have never been aware that they were so endangered and that they might be suffering this level of structural horror and structural violence is um, is very heavy for me. So in the video I am showing this what this uh, diving into the um, visualization of this horror is uh, potentially causing, but at the same time, how this visualization um, can inspire me to uh, to question my way uh, to be in, in the world. So the website also provides an insight, uh, an anonymous insight on, on the project. And then uh, it's also possible to participate. Then there's also, uh, sorry. There's a visual version of the script of the confession with uh, more images. Um, and then there's the possibility to participate. That is why thing. 
uh, it's better in English, and people can potentially leave their own uh, confession. And the idea is that the video will be, uh, and the site will be uh, ever growing um, due to this constant exchange. And um, if I can say something to um, end my intervention today, it is that um, I do think that uh, horror has been, um, has been giving me throughout these months um, a chance to consider and contact the other and its voice and its substance um, in a way that makes it possible for me to admit that I'm blind and to see through the darkness, which is something that I don't think um, I could have been um, able to do uh, in the same uh, with the same uh, power um, through other genres or through other lenses. So it has been a real pleasure uh, to build new ways to imagine and to um, research through practice and experience of um, Yes, because the thing is that um, when any being um, is no more on the word, it's like uh, the word is narrowing and uh, it's a, such an horrific thing that we tend to forget it, but uh, it's important to visualize it and to have it in mind. That was so nice. Thank you. Um, I'm number two. My name is Emilia. I am a visual artist, experimental filmmaker and experience designer. And right now I am in Copenhagen. I made a little presentation video so my dyspraxic brain won't talk in riddles. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy it. I'll just share my screen. Does the mythological definition of a troll intersect with the internet troll? And is it possible to humanize the online experience in order to fight off trolls? This research takes place in cyberspace, imagined as a complex fantasy land, an environment built on data where everything is possible, populated by avatars, trolls, fairies, cybernetic ghosts, and big brothers. Like every fairy tale, it has its light and its dark side. In this habitat, I'm hunting for trolls. The trolls have been around since the start of the internet, but the definition of a troll is ambiguous. Like with all creatures, one definition doesn't fit all. The initial definition of online trolling focuses on the conscious pursuit to lure people off topic. Like when a fisher puts out bait and wait for the fish to bite. As the internet has evolved, so has the troll. From amusement towards more direct forms of hostility, or more recently, ideologically motivated information warfare. The birth of the evil troll and the horror of the online abuser have made the link to the mythological figure of the troll relevant. But what is a troll? It's a slang for a person who posts inflammatory, disgressive, off-topic messages in an online community such as social media, for example on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. They can also post in a news group, a forum, a chat room, an online video game or blog. And the intent is to provoke readers into displaying emotional responses and manipulating others' perception. Trolling is super interesting because it questions the definition of online boundaries. A lot of people argue that the internet is an imaginary world, just a game, and things shouldn't be taken too seriously. But where to draw the line and how to deal with boundaries in a world with free speech? Can we moderate the internet without losing our privacy and freedom? And is it even possible to validate psychological damage in a non-physical space? Research shows that people with personality traits like narcissism, psychopathy are more likely to troll. Which is interesting, because why do so many people troll? The online disinhibition effect was coined by John Sula in 2004. And it basically talks about why people are more aggressive online. For example, you're invisible, you have a time disconnect, 
you have no eye contact, you don't have a body language to relate to, you can construct the other person in your mind, which dehumanizes them. All these things makes you invisible and makes you much more likely to be more harsh in your communication online. Especially women and minority groups are being harassed online, according to Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web. He especially highlights three urgent attention areas. One, the digital divide that keeps more than half of the world's women offline. Two, online safety. A lot of women already experience violence online, including sexual harassment. And three, the threat that comes from badly designed AIs that keeps repeating the discrimination through their algorithms. For example, The Guardian just did an article about Replica, which is an app where you can socialize with bots. Many men have used them as AI girlfriends to have someone to talk to, but ended up abusing them, which shows misogyny online. I did an interview with Jessica Stoyer, who's a well-known activist, feminist and porn actress. She experienced a lot of trolling. A lot of it was to do with her being a female sex worker, so especially her body got trashed a lot. A lot of misogynist language like she had no tits, she was a slut, she's a bitch, she should shut her mouth. Also a lot of people politically harassing her because of her Serbian background. She said actually a lot of the hate came from white feminists that wanted to save her. They wanted to be the saviors. She said the worst thing about these trolls is you never know where they are. They could be across the world or they could be walking just down her road being a neighbor or something. In my research, I found out that pretty much 50% of all trolls are men and 50% are women. I think that says a lot about society and how men treat women, but also how women treat women. It's only a small percentage of trolling that is super harmful. A lot of trolling target, for example, extreme right-wing parties or governmental institutions in order to question their ideologies and motives. In my project, I'm trying to visualize the hybrid between an internet troll and a folklore troll. Growing up in Sweden and Denmark, I've been hunting for trolls since I was a kid. I always went into the forest and tried to look in the moss to find them. And in this project, I'm still hunting. The definition of a Scandinavian troll is quite ambiguous as well as an internet troll. They can either be small and cute and like live in the forest, or they can be big cave-like creatures who's horrible. They all turn to stone upon contact with sunlight. They're not Christian. Lightning frightens them. They're quite slow-witted and they always try to trick humans. They dwell in isolated areas of rocks, mountains or caves or, li or lives in the woods. You can find my troll in the dark woods where it has its thick cave in the forest. It's full of moss and it's wet and it's dark. And there's trashy pieces of snacks everywhere and gross old dirty underwear and shirts. There's moss growing everywhere and it's super moist in there. And there's a sweet but super strong stank of Red Bull. The troll has a lot of objects because she's definitely an eBay queen. My institution or community I'm trying to critique is the hardcore troll community. So I had to go hunting for trolls on Reddit. Super hard to get in contact with them because obviously a lot of people don't want to share that they actually are trolls. But one night I was sitting in my kitchen and a chat popped up saying, hey, you're looking for trolls? I jumped in my seat. I had this long dialogue with a woman. Well, obviously she could be trolling me and could be an old man, but I suspect she was a woman. And she was 28 years old. Um, she was a very introvert. She said she liked to shock. She usually targets desperate men because she said that uh, she could make them do anything, especially on Tinder. She would track down the, their dress and send them weird stuff like a lot of card boxes full of sex toys. She lived in the countryside. She said she was very good looking and didn't look like a troll. None of her friends know she was a troll and she was proud of some of her trolls. Especially when she used to pretend she was a minor and then she would report all the creepy guys to the police. So I based my whole narrative and character on her and everything she told me. Um, also, she made me laugh for like 30 minutes out loud. <laughs> so I've been thinking about how to humanize the online experience. If you create tools or devices that would have humanoid features in order to create a human response instead of just sitting behind a screen, being invisible and anonymous. I was looking into speculative design by Dun and Raby. 
in order to create software instead of hardware. I also thought, why would a troll use that? Because obviously a troll kind of likes trolling, so maybe they could be an internet cafe, so maybe you could track down the troll and send it to them. Getting inspiration from Existence, a David Cronenberg film where they use very humanoid tools in order to go into a virtual reality game. I also looked at Naked Lunch, where he has a typewriter who has a face of an almost buck alien creature that looks, looks him straight into the eyes. Also Hiroshi Ishiguro's robots, who's amazing, they're very like humanoid, but also very, very sterile and how to incorporate something very humane in a dead object. So I was doing different prototypes, one based on a mouse, uh, a computer mouse and the bioengineered mouse with the ear on it to see how it felt in my hand. I also played around with the giving keyboards like bodily reactions, like it was bleeding or trying to make some synthetic skin who had like a weird texture to it to see if it gave me a different response to it. I also really like eyes and I like the fact that when you don't have eye contact, your online communication turns harsher. So I like the idea about creating a million eyes surveilling you so your communication would turn better because of the human interaction. So I created these three devices in order to help humanize the online experience. The first one is a mouse mat who has the feel of a human stomach. The second one is a synthetic hand to keep an eye on you. The third one is a sleeve you can put on top of your mouth, so when you use it, it generates skin contact. The series of objects are called Positronic Feel, for the troll that wants to change. It comes in various colors, it can heat up to body temperature, and hair can be added on request. Veins cause texture. Also don't use it in the shower. As a conclusion, and also maybe a way of connecting with the trolls in another way, I'm sending out my objects to famous trolls in Denmark. I put down a little note in the box saying, hey troll, please send me a selfie back to my email in order to have some evidence that trolls actually exist. And if that happens, it means I actually hunted down a troll, which is a dream come true. <laughs> Thank you for listening to everything in my troll brain and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. My name is Laila Sabra Rodriguez, and I'm an experimental filmmaker and researcher um, who participated in this horror research bureau. And my project is called The Creature That Crawls on the Underground Skies. Um, oh, this again. Um, and my research question is how can the complex geological structure of caves reveal and awaken nonlinear and hybrid storytelling logics? And it started initially when I uh, went to the Maastricht Caves, which is a city in the south of the Netherlands, um, and attended a tour there where I experienced um, all, these form all these different stories that were visible and documented in the cave walls, like how it was a refuge site uh, for in World War II that hosted about 5,000 people. It was an art space where artists went to carve on the limestone walls. It was um, a limestone block breaking site and eventually an archaeological discovery um, site as well. And generally when we think of caves also, we can also um, like uh, reflect it to uh, symbols for Genesis and historical traces of the like early developments of expression paintings of humans that and then for me, that kind of renders caves as or in cave walls as a witness to history and a time machine or a portal, one can say. So generally now my practice is about dissecting nonlinear and hybrid forms of storytelling within research um, and especially how that research takes form, which is in film. Um, and the cave struck me as a perfect place to kind of experiment and like uh, see how those hybrid logics can be awakened um, or revealed. So this research kind of took um, complex reiteration of a birth and, re and rebirth and death deities, uh, which originally was an intuitive process of how I related to the Mosasaurus, 
which is the ancient sea reptile predator that was excavated in those Maastricht caves in particular. And um, so, yeah, it was like the oldest thing there of 70 million years. And uh, also among an array of different stories from different historical eras. So, and I found that quite an interesting um, landscape. And so I kind of adopted it to me a methodology of thought and research. So I came with this character called the Cavus Reptilia, and in Latin that is the cave reptile. <laughs> and it's uh, it transformed into being this deity in the film that assists you as a viewer into the journey of the caves, which is also narrated by the original tour, uh, by the tour guide who I contacted. Um, and guide you through process of death in these caves which is a side of a multiplicity and I think the fact like bringing in this notion of death uh, as a beginning can um, or particularly in the caves is uh, can alter and shift the way we understand genesis and origin so I hope in the end of this film that I embody this hybrid storyteller and since I don't have much time to further introduce because I want to show the film it's uh, eight minutes so I will now play that uh, oh, yeah I have to share screen again okay is the sound on let me know Before we go in, it's only allowed to visit the tunnels with a guy. Let's go in. Indoor temperature is always 10 to 11 degrees Celsius. The humidity is more than 95%. There are no animals, only pets during the winter. There is no phone connection with the outside. Without light, it's impossible to find your way. The tunnels were an excellent shelter in times of danger. Think of the countless French attacks in the Second World War. In some places, you can still see that there was a lot of underground fighting between the French soldiers and the Dutch troops. The dome is a good example of this. During the Second World War, a large part of the second system, Slavante, was one large air raid shelter where people could stay for a long time. There was lighting in the corridors, water was pumped up, baking ovens were built, toilets were dug, and there was even a broadcast equipment. 5,000 people took shelter here a few weeks before the end of the war. There are seven cave systems that almost all became connected over time. Together, the tunnels had a length of about 160 kilometers. Until 1920, and even during World War II, you could cross the Belgian border underground. By 1770, the theory of evolution had not been yet invented. At that time, one thought that animals couldn't die out, and it was strange that people didn't know the animal by name. Now, many centuries later, we know that the shallow subtropical sea from about 70 million years ago dried up due to global warming and its inhabitants died out. The excellent hunter that the Mosasaur was, was a length of sometimes up to 20 meters, a weight between 3,000 and 4,000 kilo, and a top speed of 40 kilometers per hour died out. 
17 million years later, its fossil remains were found during the block breaking.
Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, my name is Veronica, and I'm a researcher at the University of Underground. And sort of my field uh, of internet interest, interest and research uh, was uh, the audiovisual archive. So I've been uh, metaphorically, but also literally, searching all sorts of nooks and corners of archives, but also the internet and even some personal collections, because there are a lot of like uh, media collector. And uh, my question was sort of uh, what happens when we sort of try to find an audiovisual detail that the current archive protocols are not set for, uh, to search for. And I wonder what uh, an audiovisual objects, what type of audiovisual objects did not survive to the present days uh, or where they end up sort of. And um, finally, after a quest, uh, I got to one fallen star that disappeared from the cinematographic and audiovisual sky, and it was Starwipe. That's why my uh, project uh, is called Starwipe at the excavation of the lost gimmick. And my uh, question was, or has been, what would happen if the Ebonne technique uh, was summoned from the depths of the archive and will have transformed uh, our understanding of the limitation of archive? Or might, might this even trigger like starway apocalypse that will sort of destroy the archive, but also the individual culture, what will happen? And that's why I would like to you to invite you to join me on the expedition in which we will sort of try to uh, attempt uh, or to excavate a star wipe. And um, sort of what awaits uh, for you if you decided to agree and join me. So our individual journey will begin in the sort of high, uh, high in the sky, will begin uh, high in the night sky, and we will go through a small scientific presentation, as you can see, uh, and we will see how many stars are there and what types of stars are on the sky, but also on the earth, and maybe also even in our computer interfaces, and maybe what stars we have uh, sort of missed or didn't see. And uh, at the end uh, of our excavation journey, there's also the question if we will be punished as for our illicity, as happened to many archaeologists uh, when they've sort of brought a curse upon themselves because of their greed or something, or what would happen if something will happen or nothing will happen, or will we be so successful that the star web will be finally in the museum or even, even we could reuse it. So that's my question, what would happen? And now we will uh, watch uh, the videography journey. So yeah, just a second. Yeah, and also I forgot, um, I forgot to add warning. There are like flashing images and stroboscopic sequences ahead. And there are also maybe loud sounds like in the video essay. So if you have problem with it, so just keep it in mind and uh, keep it low, so yeah, enjoy it. Look at all those stars. They are everywhere, and they have been in the sky since the dawn of time. Their presence has stimulated human imagination, transformed our comprehension of the universe, and provoked us to achieve almost impossible scientific milestones. However, what do stars mean in and for our modern society? According to Webster Dictionary, there are several definitions of the word star. The first one is from a celestial perspective. A star is a fixed luminous point in the night sky, but it is actually a large, remote, incandescent body, just like the sun. The second one is from an astrological perspective. A star could be a planet, a constellation, or a configuration that influences a person's fortunes or personality. The third one is from a showbiz perspective, in which a star could signify a very famous or talented entertainer, actor or actress, or sports player, or even a politician. The fourth one is from a semiotic perspective, what we recognize as a star in our culture represents a conventional or stylized shape which typically has five or more points. 
like an asterisk symbol. And from the Star wipe is an uncommon but unique editing technique that connects two moving images through a wipe in the shape of a star. Just look in the archive. Archive is a set of rules that governs the exchange of information between an institution and a subject looking for a specific collection of data. Archiving is based on conservation, categorization, and hierarchization of data in order to keep the preserved materials traceable and recognizable. Although not everything can be saved. But the star-shaped transition once looked futuristic, yet now it seems like an acronistic joke, and instead of quite adoration, it provokes just laughter. Unlike conventional editing, the star wipe is a startling effect used to disrupt, emphasize, or ridicule the scene. The gimmick is not merely an invisible tool that performs a given task, in this case, linking one image to another. It elevates editing into a spectacle spectacle that could a turn editing into a special effect b mock our learned patterns of perception c transform cinematic temporality despite its visibility it is almost impossible to see it in any archive whatsoever it has disappeared from contemporary audiovisual and editing program <laughs> The results of our archaeological excavations are thus. In the subsquare A3, a fragment of animated TV series from the 90s. In the subsquare C2, a piece of animated TV series from the 2010s. In the subsquare B4, an identified amateur material. In the subsquare A2, an ancient artifact of television culture from the 1980s. And finally, in the subsquare B1, a contemporary piece of television production.
The Star Wipe has two sides to it. One is a distinguished editing method that can be used and reused. And the second one is an inseparable bit of a visual dataset. What is crucial, the Star Wipe is embedded in the visual material. It cannot exist outside the images, which is supposed to be connecting. Otherwise, it would be invisible, which is exactly as we found it. was all the um, credits are in progress so nothing more thank you so much so uh, hello i'm uh, pauline rip and i'm a designer of uh, irrational and uh, mocked and even false knowledges uh, and by searching for these knowledges, I try to reveal a certain belief uh, uh, system that exists in authentic and constructed realities. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see this? So um, for this program, I worked on the construction and deconstruction and the reconstruction of history and how historical figures are uh, designed to charm uh, audiences in uh, divisive ways. I chose the, the context of France because uh, we are right now in the middle of an uh, election period where the question of identity and the origins of France is uh, omnipresent. So I met uh, different actors within uh, historical institutions, such as a lecturer and guide of an archaeological museum, an archaeologist, an history teacher of a secondary school, and also actor in historical reenactments. I met the great root of uh, Brittany and a specialist of uh, foundation stories. So the versatility of history was uh, then revealed in multiple aspects, history as a spectacle and entertainment, as a trace of memory that is as objective as it is subjective, as between spirituality and popular culture uh, and the national narrative, questioning the very fact of uh, who owns uh, the knowledge of, of history. So I uh, based my research on the national narrative. Uh, so the national narrative is like the fictionalized accounts that the nation uh, offers to its own history. So it's a short, uh, in short, it's an it's a amalgamation of more or less heroic or legendary episodes, uh, which uh, highlight value considered essential by the nation. So it manifests itself uh, for, um, in many reasons, this is an extreme manifestation, but uh, you uh, remember the, uh, at the capital, this Q shaman, he's like uh, playing a Scandinavian hero uh, by like um, showing this uh, uh, masculinity and uh, and showing this uh, yeah uh, Viking um, uh, attributes with the horns. So in France we don't have um, the Vikings, but we have the Gauls. So I would like to do a little lesson of uh, French history. Uh, so if you can uh, answer the questions and put your mics on. So. Um, I'll take your books, page uh, four, please. A long time ago, our country was called Gaul. Its inhabitants were the Gauls. Look carefully, we are in the village. What is the color of his hair? Someone answered. Blonde. Red. Yes, good. Uh, next question. What is the shape of his mustache? 
maybe I can help you here because it's a bit hard. It's a dropping stash. And so what you have to remember for next time is that a long time ago, our country was called Gold and the girls were tall, had blue eyes, a dropping mustache and blonde hair. So it seems that everything is done uh, in these books to give us an attractive and nostalgic image. They are blonde with blue eyes, beautiful dropping mustache, their clothes are colored, they are represented, uh, bare chests, and they are always described as proud with a warlike uh, temperament. Um, and here you see on, the, on this uh, picture, you can see the fighters. The women also seem to be in the minor position, although archeologists uh, inform us that they had a very important place. So over time, this uh, Gallic uh, temperament has served um, a cultural anchor for the entire French political spectrum from the extreme left to the extreme right and uh, including more moderate movements, but also citizen initiatives such, such as the Yellow Vest movement. All of them, we use this term to characterize the French as this uh, original uh, resistant fighting against the Romans at the risk of their lives. So um, unfortunately, the, there appears to be a, a temptation to be shared by this uh, violent and romantic heritage. Uh, although this vision of the past excludes many, pandering to a vision of white, blonde hair, clear eyes, representative historic figure is not uh, accessible to all. So the figure of the goal is uh, increasingly appearing in extremist nationalist uh, circles as tools and symbols of division between the native French, what is called native French and mixed blood French who will uh, obviously never really be able to be a Gaulish figure uh, as a true ancestor. So the whole point here is that a simple and uh, naive uh, illustration uh, of the Gallic camp in a textbook can be extrapolated into a national identity crisis, uh, finding anger and social factors around the nostalgic mirage. So mm -hmm. uh, because uh, even if we are not studying the past like this anymore, the idea of the goal as an ancestor stayed uh, in our collective imagination, imagination, sorry. So with this video, I will uh, introduce uh, my project, Non-Historical Reenactments, Our Ancestor the Gauls. Chapitre 1, Nos Ancêtres les Gaulois. Nos Ancêtres, ce sont les Gaulois. Le Gaulois réfractaire au changement. Alors dimanche, le seul vote gaulois. Donc, le fait que nous descendons des gaulois, ce qui n'a rien à voir. Gaulois, romains. Nous en fait les gaulois, c'est le slogan le plus antiraciste qui soit. Alors l'autre, il dit euh, que quand on devient français, nos ancêtres sont gaulois. Enfant, tu vois sur la couverture de ce livre les fleurs et les fruits de France. Dans ce livre, tu apprendras l'histoire de France. Tu dois aimer la France parce que la nature l'a faite belle et parce que son histoire l'a faite grande. Où vous devenez français, vos ancêtres, ce sont les Gaulois et ces versins gétérix. Mon père est hongrois, on ne m'a pas appris l'histoire de la Hongrie. Mon grand-père maternel est grec, on ne m'a pas appris l'histoire de la Grèce. Au moment où je suis français, j'aime la France, j'apprends l'histoire de France, je parle le français et mes ancêtres, 
sont les ancêtres de la France. C'est ça la simulation. Ce peuple luthérien qui a vécu les transformations des dernières décennies n'est pas exactement le gaulois réfractaire au changement. Immigration supplémentaire, réglementation faite en dépit du bon sens, asphyxie progressive de notre agriculture, de notre pêche, bref, de tous les métiers qui existent depuis des siècles et que l'on voyait ici dans le village d'Astérix, village typique à la française, où tout le monde travaillait, mais savait et pouvait aussi faire la fête en chantant et en mangeant du sanglier autour d'un verre de vin. Um, yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> so, uh, uh, sorry. so yeah, I uh, kind of use the malleability of history and take advantage of the subjectivity of the national narrative to take uh, it as a tool in my turn. Um, and to uh, fetishize the air, to devirilize these warriors uh, as sensitive and peaceful uh, villagers, to transform the image of this uh, exacerbated French mm -hmm. origin. So here the air is uh, a non-historical uh, agglomerate mixing popular culture, archaeological facts, and even attributes from the Versailles court in an ex exuberant air anachronism. So the horror and violence is not necessarily in uh, its most uh, visible form. There is no need for wars and blood to pervert uh, collective imagination. The violence lies in the construction of a blonde, blue-eyed French identity, resisting at all times against a foreign threat, threat uh, that is as close uh, as it is distant. So here the weapons are no longer uh, swords and shields, but they are um, combs and uh, serving as tools uh, as well as political symbols symbols uh, which we are worn uh, uh, which are worn also at the belt like weapons weapons so yeah the last question i would say is like how do we represent the future we want to live in and i will go just through quickly the making So I copied actually real uh, archaeological objects, but uh, they were used for chariots for war and I put them as ornaments in the hairs. And these are actually true Gallic combs that I recreated also and repaired. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So my name is Kat and I'm a researcher and artist. And my project is called From This World Into the Other Land. And the project was creating ritual workshops to encourage ancestral memories and connections. Um, so my research question became, after some kind of shifting and different research processes, how can concepts from pagan spirituality and the Celtic spiritual paradigm of the afterlife be used to consider and discover ancestral connection through contemporary ritual design? 
So I started my research looking at the past, um, very broad, but particularly how experiences of the past travel through communities. And I looked at intergenerational trauma specifically, um, which um, is a theory which understands how our memories are stored in our DNA and how experiences of trauma from past events such as conflicts and famines and lots of things that happen um, in, in communities and have kind of passed through DNA and affect people's mental and physical health in the present. Um, so I was looking at epigenetics and thinking about um, how people understand their own relationship with their ancestors. But um, what I ended up kind of thinking about during this research is not only the genetic traits which are carried, which are physical, such as illnesses and even mental health predispositions, but also why we're so drawn to those things. Why do we want to understand so much our ancestors' experiences, especially with the booming popularity of things like DNA tests, um, which tell us um, what percentage of what ancestry we are and people who really want to delve into their family trees and with sites like ancestry.com and even TV shows which are really popular um, about finding out more about your past ancestors. So this project kind of under asks the question what is the value of looking backwards connecting to the past and um, thinking about bygone members of our families or at least people that we feel connected to. So in terms of my interviews, I started by asking experts on this topic. So I spoke to Yaben Horik, who is a researcher about intergenerational trauma, specifically ghosts um, from the past having agency in the present. And her research investigates how the ghosts of ancestors of those who died in the Holocaust are considered active agents in the world of the people that they live with. So the relatives who live with those ghosts um, are impacted by them. And I also spoke to Sarita Samaratino, who is a past life therapist um, in Argentina. And um, she had got into this vocation because of the loss of a child a long time ago. And um, she told me that past life therapy allows people to work through their grief um, because of their understanding that a loved one or even ancestors who are long gone haven't necessarily gone forever, but they've entered this new era of being. So I was just kind of gathering intel from different sources. And I ended up thinking more specifically about um, different types of spiritual practices because of something that my dad said to me about his own funeral plans, <laughs> quite strangely. So this is Gronje Velik and it's a hill fort that's in Northern Ireland. And my dad insists he wants to be buried here. And we spoke for a long time about this and he really wants to be buried here, even though he hasn't lived in Ireland for over 40 years. But this is a really important thing for him. Like he feels really connected to this place. He feels really connected to this building. It's like such an important part of his history, even though he hasn't really seen it more than maybe three or four times in his life. And this kind of, got me thinking about his cultural paradigm and um, what kind of belief systems um, people have with their ancestry and what is why is this so prevalent to someone who doesn't live in their home country. Um, so then I started to think about kind of Celtic and pre-Christian belief systems as that is his heritage, um, obviously for a long way back. And um, I was investigating the spiritual revival of Celtic belief. And um, this is becoming really popular and also highly romanticized. And um, Pauline's um, touched a little bit on that, how the iconography is often kind of repurposed and taken um, and often used for kind of bad purposes, like white supremacist agendas and people who really identify in a nationalist way with it. But it's also having a real moment of neo-paganism where lots of people are using these kind of rituals and using this iconography to connect them more to their sense of place and belonging. And overwhelmingly pagan and witchcraft spirituality is booming as people try and reconnect to their community and sense of place. And often there's a sense of ecological responsibility, gender equality and spiritual growth associated with these belief systems. So I had a little field trip to the Embassy of the Free Mind in Amsterdam, if anyone's ever been there. It's um, just a fun museum that's full of kind of esoteric books and lots of 
things like that. And there was a really good book on Irish Druids and old Irish religions that I was reading. So I was thinking about how these pre-Christian beliefs could be different to and in our understanding of how to relate to our ancestors. And that led me to this kind of concept of the afterlife, which um, is that it's possible to enter the afterlife, which is called the other land in Celtic belief, um, in a way that is not possible to enter a Christian heaven. So it's very dissimilar to a Christian heaven in that it's more accessible and it's much more closely linked with the mortal world. And it's a place home to our ancestors and spirits and deities and a place that you can cross into and communicate with your ancestors. So it's, it's much closer spiritually to the world that we live in. So I just wanted to use that as a general concept for my work. And I wanted to do primary research, finding out how people do connect to their ancestors. So I was doing interviews with lots of different people about specifically objects which they felt connected to and felt gave them a sense of their ancestors' lives. So this is an example of a friend of mine um, who I had an interview with. Uh, this is a silver bracelet which was repurposed from jewelry um, that survived the holocaust so the original jewelry was melted down and then made into this bangle and it's very significant to her and i was speaking to lots of different people that's just one example but there was many different objects and it was often toys and kind of keepsakes that their family members had given them really simple things and um, because these everyday things they don't have to even be special are just reminders of the world we live in and who inhabits those worlds and they kind of every day become sacred in this context. So I started off by trying to express this through sound, but I didn't find this was the best medium um, to kind of build the worlds of these objects to feel connected in that ancestral way. So I decided to kind of turn to the actual ritual itself and that almost became the creative tool was asking the questions. And I had a really great interview with Dara Malloy who used to be a Catholic priest but is now a Celtic monk. And he was a creator of rituals. So he developed his own ritual practices based on Celtic spirituality. And um, he was telling me about the popularity of rituals that aren't only weddings and funerals, but like less common markers of rites of passage and how he's basically working constantly because these have become so popular. And um, he had left the faith of Catholicism because he wanted to find a spirituality that he felt connected to his own history and his own ancestry. So as I was trying to design these rituals, I was experimenting with a kind of space that they might take place in. Um, and I was working with a plastic specialist sculpture um, and just doing some experiments really. And we were trying to build this world and we used a lot of natural iconography, but also using these man-made materials was kind of to um, capture this idea that um, the everyday that kind of ordinary objects have symbolic significance um, but then I moved into kind of trying to recreate some objects that people had told me about that was a piece of rope um, a participant had told me about and I was kind of experimenting with ritualistic symbols there just to kind of like get an idea of aesthetic but um, I had a great interview which is actually in the podcast um, with Natalie Wars Castillo, who considers herself a baby witch. And um, during this interview, I really got a sense that um, it's not just the aesthetic that is important with these ritual practices. Um, and it's very much um, like a spirituality. And she um, says there's no such thing as McDonald's witchcraft. And we discussed the fact that the wellness industry witchcraft is often very aesthetic, but um, to her, it's nothing to do with that or tropes about um, what witchcraft looks like, but it's definitely like an ingrained spiritual knowledge and craft for her. It's something very private. So thinking about this and what a more contemporary witchcraft practice might look like, which is outside of this world of kind of aesthetic wellness industry, spirituality, um, kind of made me think about how to design something which people could use and I got some workshops um, going as well with participants who I, I asked to provide me an image of an altar 
Um, so I just asked a few friends to kind of experiment with this different, these different activities that I'd created. And um, one of them was creating a memorial altar. And I've got a couple of pictures now that people sent me. Um, and the final work that I created was a creative practice in a digital handbook. So at the moment, this is taking the form of kind of like publication. And it is a collection of rituals based on the activities that I'd trialed with a few participants. And this one here is about portal objects, which was one of my initial research questions. And this is just a collection of different things that people can do to feel closer to their ancestry. So it's a work in progress and it's been trialed. I'm still kind of in the process of working with different people and asking them to try things out and I'm going to change them. Um, this was one that was about how to imagine and create a homeland and what that might look like. And they're kind of a blend of creative artistic endeavors and also um, using these ritualized ideas of um, kind of like things that venerate your ancestors and just kind of getting the reader to think about those things themselves. But yeah, for further developments, I would like to kind of develop this into a bigger project um, with more time. And I think something with a narrative structure, like a graphic novel containing ritual activities, is maybe the way I'll go with it. Um, but yeah, that is my presentation. Kat, that was so lovely. I'm going to um, jump into mine now and I'll just share my screen. Okay. Everyone can see? Yeah? Yeah, cool. So my project's called When Leaky Bodies Reek, um, and I titled it in, as an inherently problematic title because we don't, don't like to think about our own bodies as reeking or the bodies of people that we care about as reeking. Um, but we'll get into a little bit what reeking kind of means in this context. Um, and so the research questions that I kind of started out with my research is like, how do bodily anxieties and leaky body haunt us outside of this visual lens that we sort of prioritize, especially some in the arts and how are qualities such as embodied difference for disease and per are perceived in sort of this sensorial context of smell and what boundaries do we place in ourselves and on others to keep away the oozing and wafting aromas of the horrors that lay within at bay and why? Um, and then the last question to kind of tie it all together is how and why do some smells end up haunting us? Um, a little bit about the background. Um, so leaky bodies and the disease bodies are these bodies that have this like are objectified either as a cultural curiosity or viewed within this lens of like the abnormal, which then in turn is taken to define what is normal within society. And we see this quite often um, in terms of uh, no one wants to fall within an abnormal range of sort of bodily qualities, um, even though there is diversity within sort of bodily qualities um, and uh, ties together also with this notion of waste and what we consider to be waste and bodily waste, um, which has this history of waste and bodily waste in itself, things like urine and um, feces and blood uh, being a great harm to public health since the late 18th century. Um, and so how we consider sort of abnormal waste functions and normal waste functions really dictates how we sort of view the leaky body because oftentimes we don't like to see bodies within themselves as being so permeable, but in order to function, they do need to be quite permeable and leak in essence. Um, and so for my work, I collaborated uh, with the, uh, had an institutional collaborator at the BioArt Society slash Solu Space. Um, in Finland for their Mother's Becomings program, which was hosted by Marta de Menzies at the Alta Design Factory in BioGarage. And this was also supported by James Evans, who's the manager of the BioGarage. Um, and I did a workshop there that took place in Helsinki, Finland, which I'll get to a bit later in my presentation. And I also consulted on a smells expert um, who's a physicist, Dr. Andreas Merschen, who is working to create a uh, electronic nose to detect diseases. Um, and some insights that I had from interviewing Andreas, um, which 
there's another interview that I've done with him for our podcast as well, um, is that animals can diagnose smells associated with disease way better than humans can. Uh, yeah, and uh, animals can also make, especially dogs specifically can make generalizations about uh, certain compositions of volatile compounds in a way that humans and machines really struggle to. So they're able to smell, um, they'll be able to identify particular diseases even if the compositions of those diseases, that smell formula is a little bit different every time. Um, and different people end up producing different compositions of volatile compounds, even if they are related to the same disease. So if two people have bladder cancer, they can produce its a completely different composition of like volatile compounds associated with it. Um, and all of this sort of information um, about these sort of leaking parts of our bodies is uh, kind of falling into this category of what Andreas calls osmodata, um, which is any information around leaking substances of the body. And what he has found is that this information, especially when it comes to medical surveillance and um, sort of data surveillance around it, it becomes more valuable over time. So it's quite um, a problematic uh, issue when it comes to using sort of surveillance and the medical gaze on bodies if you look at smells. Um, and so I did many different sort of experimentations to kind of literally smell these sorts of bodily odors and relations to disease, one of them being tried to synthesizing the scent of uh, trimethylaminuria, otherwise known as TMAU, which is a from a genetic um, condition, but they will, individuals who suffer from this genetic condition will also have a strong fishy-like odor, which has been characterized by Dr. George Pretty. Um, and I positioned them within sort of the context of a designer perfume bottle because um, the way that genetic-based conditions are talked about and sort of uh, that we can then design humans and make designer babies and improve humanity and health. It seemed quite an interesting contrast that, um, and there was a horror within that sort of designer element as well that I found um, especially haunting with a packaging of something that smells, something packaged really nicely, but smells quite bad. Um, and then I sort of got very interested in interspecies narratives about care, surveillance, and horror, because as I talked with Andreas, um, uh, dogs right now are the, currently the best sort of odor detection devices that we have. Um, and so if animals can detect these diseases and odors better than humans, then their scent composition must create this sort of multi-species experience. And how could I potentially create my own sort of ways to have multi-species experiences outside of the typical research element that's being done by scientists like Dr. Clara Guest, who's a collaborator of Andreas. Um, and so I tried to imagine different sort of cancer odor detection training devices for dogs that could be done at home and not within a, um, a facility like Dr. Clara Guest has. Um, particularly, I was focusing on sort of odor detection systems related to urine output since a lot of sort of the volatile compounds that um, relate to particular diseases are found in urine. And so my initial sort of design was something that had to go inside of a toilet and could create different like odor compounds, of volatile comp uh, the different volatile compounds within certain diseases that could help train dogs. However, when designing sort of like toys or things for dogs, you need to take into account that you can't have any sort of like distractions besides the stimuli within itself. So having a visual thing within a toilet can kind of like mess up the sort of um, training process. And so I tried to imagine what toilet trainers for dogs would look like um, and came up with this sort of advertisement that we maybe should let dogs put their heads in our toilets and it could actually end up saving our lives um, and how that could make man's best friend even a whole lot better. Um, and that potentially these sort of toilet trainers could be uh, made from like a liquid formula that came from real human urine. Um, and different formulations could be associated with different types of diseases, one for bladder cancer, one for prostate cancer, one for untreated diabetes, urinary tract infections, and now even COVID-19, um, which it would be all quite nice if our dog could just tell us if we had COVID or not, so we don't have to go get a test. Um, and these urine samples would be taken from real life medical patients. Um, and so this sort of training came up and where toilet trainers had 
to pick up on different types of uh, dog training techniques. And uh, there's actually quite a very standardized way in which you train dogs to respond to smells. And um, I just sort of was trying to recontextualize it with how you can get them to identify it within your toilet in itself. So uh, do the thing that I guess most animal trainers don't want dogs to do, but have a dog go to the toilet and check inside the bowl to make sure that your urine is fine instead of, um, I guess, dog trainers would want you to keep the dog out of the bathroom and out of your toilet. Um, but the process really involves first getting them introduced to the stimuli within itself and to continuously sniff it and be able to then identify that scent in a room and be able to go to it straight away. And while doing this the whole time, giving them food incentives as um, reinforcement. And uh, typically within training for smell-based things, including for bombs and other sorts of ways that we train dogs, it's all really about food reinforcement as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's like, yes, you found the cancer. Here's your Here's your delicious treat. Um, and so, but where is this real human urine coming from? And this sort of aspect of the, the speculative uh, narrative of this product really brings into mind a lot of the horror surrounding laws about bodily waste between different, and it, how these vary between different countries and even between states in the United States. And so I decided to look more at the US because um, the country I live in, Germany is quite strict actually about this, but in the US it's really messed up where I'm originally from. Um, and donors of bodily materials that have been uh, given to research, the, those people have no ownership or rights to those materials, including urine, blood, and genetic samples. Um, and there's this really, it's very loose about what upholds patient privacy. Can you identify a patient from their urine, for example? It, there's a lot of confusion about that. And also within the US, there's a lot of laws about how taking urine samples falls under with the Fourth Amendment of the US Constitution about search and seizure procedures because a lot of different companies in the US can request a drug test sample from individuals working for them. Um, and in, within the sort of Fourth Amendment, it's this sort of individualized reasonable suspicion rather than a probable cause uh, is needed in order to obtain urine samples. Um, and lastly, I set out to then go kind of create my own bodily leakage and waste with uh, real people um, at the Mothers Becomings workshop um, in Helsinki. And so the Mothers Becoming workshop uh, investigates the junctions between leaky borderlands between motherhood and otherhood, tentatively probing into the potentials of bringing forth an insurgent, but also non-innocent politics of care by investigating the strangeness of mothers as it pushes against conventional notions of body, self, family, and belonging. Um, and sort of the aspects that I brought into my workshop um, was kind of looking at sort of care and also surveillance and the medical gaze as a form of care and how medical gaze kind of brings about a very horrific element to caring narratives as well as how closely related they can be to surveillance um, in itself. And so the workshop consisted of an introductory lecture where I introduced a lot of these principles to people who had never really talked about smell before in such a, a particular way. And then we had a sweat inducing activity um, it was going to be originally because we were in Finland, it was going to be using the sauna, um, but we ended up doing a HIIT workout, um, which I also prepared for, and some other people within the workshop itself, because we had a very young uh, toddler as well, did some other sorts of sweat inducing activities based that matched their needs and abilities of everyone involved. Some of this uh, involved people wearing all of their winter coats, as you can see in the image because um, it was snowing quite heavily when I was in Finland. And then this was followed up by a group discussion with about smell associations and memory sharing about smells that both have haunted people and uh, times where they've haunted others by smelling and emitting odors in a particular way, which was quite interesting. Um, and then lastly, we did an odor extraction and distillation from all of the sweat that was accumulated in these white t-shirts that everyone was wearing. Um, so here are various images of everyone participating in our little physical activity. Um, uh, and it was quite interesting because I'm not a workout instructor. So lots of people would take over and be like, oh, this move makes me always sweat a lot. And so gauging kind of what activity and movement causes lots of leaking of the body within itself and sharing that with everyone else was kind of a nice um, contribution that everyone could make. 
And then um, people would tear up the t-shirts that they had brought to wear to collect their sort of uh, leaking sweat. Uh, and then this was then taken to the bio garage where you can see I'm here with um, James Evans, the manager, trying to set up our initial steam distillation system from the various stocks where at the bio garage. And I would take the strips of the t-shirts down and put them into sort of a middle distillation chamber. Um, to have the steam distillation occur. And luckily, because we were in Finland, there was abundance of snow. So we were able to use that to condense the liquid, help condense liquid back into sort of a bodily odor-based perfume, um, which uh, everyone was able to then, once they got theirs, um, they sort of shared in this moment of um, smelling each odor and seeing what it smelled like. And we found that oftentimes, um, because everyone had brought a new t-shirt, many of the odors smelled a little bit like body odors, but also smelled a lot like brand new t-shirt. And uh, it wasn't until I had gotten back to Andreas, again, for our podcast interview that he suggested next time I should use people's socks uh, because they are a little bit more odor filled. Um, and so I am currently working on creating another installation of this workshop here in Germany, in Berlin at this place called Mal Anders and Schlottenberg. And so hopefully then we'll be doing it with socks and seeing as well what sort of odorous based smell compositions will emerge. And that is my presentation. So my name's James Nola, AKA Necro. Uh, firstly, I'd like to say amazing work from my fellow researchers. It's been such an honor to have this experience with you guys. And today I'll be showing you the short film I've been working on. And it is called Who's the Animal? And it explores the relationships between queer identity, gender performance and isolated communities within the context of rural farming. How we choose to express ourselves can often be dictated by the surroundings and it can be difference between wearing a mask and living your authentic fulfilled life. My background in makeup and special effects led to the development of these characters centered around these storylines by creating these animal human hybrids that blur concepts around gender performance and challenging our relationship to animals. I adore horror films. Um, it was my gateway into, into special effects, um, especially films from the 80s. Um, I found an eruption of camp horror films to educate me as a child through this. And in this film, I draw upon, even though it's a later date, but like elements of the black and white camp horror, the melodramatic gestures alongside characters and disrupt gender binaries. The characters are just as important as the story itself, using performers that are all within the farming community, reimagined as hybrid livestock. The actors' performances and the willingness to be a part of my project originates from real life connections, interviews and makeup sessions with each individual. Using makeup to share the power it has to free up inhibitions, explore other sides of oneself and create new narratives. I collaborated with a musician to create the track the film, for the film. They were given the script concepts in the final cut to produce a track inspired by the emotions felt in the film. I wanted to have a very ominous feel uh, using a lot of string instruments, again, like leading back to that time period I'm wanting to capture. The piece focuses on these characters um, existing within a world dictated by one man. They escape in their own minds, but are always remi reminded of their place within their relationship to this farmer. Bound by these realities of their duties, they fall in line much to the delight of the farmer. The set expression within the mask acts as a front, his forced expression both strained and unnerving. He is ultimately just as bound to his ways as these characters have been to him. His own pleasure only exists as long as he is the one controlling the situation and the viewer gets a glimpse into the headspace, his headspace. 
the key to both liberation and vengeance is found within one lipstick, an object of sexuality, strength and defiance. As one of the characters discovers their own key to freedom, so does the acknowledge the characteristics unfamiliar to the masked farmer. For him, acknowledging is power. He holds information as a weapon of control and this subverse allows a new narrative to begin. The farmer is ended by a material he is um, accustomed to. The rap is used um, a lot on farms. Like it's, uh, it's a very like uh, thin plastic that is used all over the farm. Like you'll understand once you see it, hopefully. But yeah, I just wanted you to know that that context of, of the materials that have been tried to be used uh, through the film. And these um, characters bask in their own newfound freedom as he is placed back into the same land he forced others to take care for him. So without further ado, I'll show you the movie. It's nine minutes, so enjoy. All right, better share the screen first. Okay, can everyone see that in here? Yeah. 
That was my little piece. Thank you for the time. Thank you, James. That was amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll. Oh, I need to share my screen. Is it shared? Oh. Um, so I'm going to navigate the website that I created for this project so I can, in order to explain it, but first there's a little video introduction. The parasitical child is a speculative exploration of more than human and human relations and symbiotic nutrition. It asks that you contemplate on and create space for the healing potential that nurturing relationships between non-humans and humans hold. It questions our attempts to connect with the natural artificially. Placing anti-solutionist strategies at its core, the parasitical child welcomes the relinquishment of rational thought and the birth of parasitical reflection. Do not take this product if you are unwilling to cultivate the parasites with care. The instructions must be met. If one does not follow the instructions, we do not recommend ingestion of the parasite. We are not responsible for whatever happens due to lack of care. Wait, can you see? Because I can't see myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. Sorry, my mom was calling me. Um, but yeah, I'll continue introducing the project. But so a few questions of this project. Well, the project is called Parasitical Child Nurturing the Non-Human and More Than Human. Um, um, <laughs> what, um, a few questions that it asks is, what methods will be used to maintain our hyper-industrialized lives while feeding our biological need to connect with the natural world? How can we use ideas of disgust and the grotesque to uncover the real horrors of society? What does the future where all our interactions with the non-human are fabricated look like? How compelling can these fabricated experiences of connections with the natural be? How can we create symbiotic improvement for the future? Who will have access to the natural? 
who will have to endure these lab made supplements and how can we reshape our current relationships with the natural to improve mutual health. So this project calls forward memories that allow connections with the past and facilitate questions about our inhabitants and ourselves. It highlights this mutual nurturing between us and the organism that lives in our bodies and how that relationship is chaotic and complicated. So the parasitical child proposes a healing, proposing healing as a learning process, a journey of self-exploration and a way of understanding um, to feel safe within this body full of parasites. It's this asexual experience of motherhood where one is nurture, where one's nurturing practice reflects how they will be nurtured back. And it focuses on needing to bring back these interactions with parasites that have existed for most of our history. This is just a picture of the parasites that I was specifically looking at. I was looking at helm helminths, and these are a few helminths and their eggs. Um, I'm going to speak briefly about a few of the theoretical things behind the project. So it was looking, I was looking deeply into the relationship between nature and mental health. And there's loads of research is stating that there's um, cities are associated with higher rates of mental health problems compared to rural areas, almost 40% of risk of depression, 20% more anxiety, doubled the risk of schizophrenia, in addition to loneliness, isolation, and stress. Um, a report that was particularly interesting to me was the Mental Health Foundation report of 2021, and it focused on the theme of the relationship between nature and mental health. And overall, the most important implication of the research was this need to shift our focus from getting people to visit natural and sometimes remote spaces to giving attention to the nature around them. So this idea of nurturing the nature that surrounds us rather than seeing nature as a tra travel destination was really interesting to me. A second pillar was environmental racism and classism. In these pictures over here, you can see the difference between the landscape architecture or the amount of green space that exists between space um, cities in America with high income and low income and the amount of green space is quite different and across the world lower income communities and communities of color are living in significantly more gray areas than wealthier wider neighborhoods so in America. Um, rich Americans enjoy 50% more greenery in their environment compared to lower income communities. And in cases where nine out of 10 people um, live below the poverty line, this number increases to 65%. The last theory that I was looking into was Hellman therapy. And this is a therapy where you purposefully um, ingest parasites, these parasitic worms, um, and it treats inflammatory and autoimmune disorders. The preclinical trials have suggested that it has beneficial effects to infections on inflammatory bowel disease, um, asthma, uh, as well as other autoimmune and inflammatory disorders. A lot of, I, I've seen a few people state that this has actually worked for them, and there's quite a few studies to prove that this is actually um, quite helpful. And the hypothesis is this, this comes from um, over sanitation and this distancing of ourselves from these parasites that up to a few decades ago were a huge part of our lives have been causing these health issues. So this project takes all of these things and kind of approaches um, mental health crisis, social inequality, racism, sexism, climate change and ecology as all interconnected. The key principles are this idea of the parasite and of care. The parasite most known as a living thing that lives on in or another thing, usually causing it harm, and care as a form of protection, preservation, encouragement of development. So the project proposes a rebranding of these things and exploring them through the grotesque as a means of highlighting behaviors we should actually be disgusted by. It presents the parasite as a form of creating symbiotic relationships with the more than human and also radical nurture of the more than human while care and nurture as something ugly and humbling and a direct confrontation of our own humanity and reminder of our death. It also looks at the effects of um, um, the legacies of colonization and things like Western medicine, capital, capitalism, over sanitation and industrialization, and how these things often with an aesthetic of cleansing, cleanliness can have a perceived rotten core. And through all of this comes the speculative scenario of the parasitical child, where it brings you to 
a space where due to over-industrialization, only the most privileged have access to natural spaces. And the rest of us are left only to interact, uh, left only with false interactions with the natural implanted in, within our bodies through lab-made parasites. So you can, in order to get the product, theoretically, you have to click here and answer a few of the reflective questions. But I'm going to skip through that because of time. But this is just a better image of the product I made. I also have it here. I don't know if you can see me because I can't see myself, but I'll just show it there. Um, so the way in which it works is in order to get different, the parasite can heal you mentally or physically. And depending on what you choose to feed it is the way in which it will work. So in order to heal you mentally, you have to feel, feed it um, pieces of your hair and nails. And this allows for the parasite to develop from its egg form. And it will implement false na false names false memories of like positive interactions with nature, whereas the other one, you feed it um, saliva. And that one is a health one where it will fix autoimmune and other, um, other autoimmune and inflammatory disorders. This is a little explanation that comes with the, with the kit. I just put it here because it says quite a bit about the parasite and I also, have a review section where because it's recommended that the parasite is ingested and you create it into some sort of like sauce or jelly it comes with like a sample recipe that you can make the um yeah this these are the reviews but yeah i don't know if you can see me my computer screen is a mess. I can show you the, the sample now because I feel like now you can see me. But this is the recipe. I won't, yeah. My background is kind of ruining it, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Natalia. It was super interesting. I would really like to have it actually now. Um, so my name is Bianca Schick, and I'm the last uh, yeah, person researcher presenting today. So I hope you're still not too tired, but we can do it. OK. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I will try to uh, let the audio go directly from your speakers, if that's possible. I watched the tutorial, so I don't know if it works. So the best thing is to use headphones, if you like, because the sound is better. OK, so um, I thought it would be nice. Wait, let's try here. Okay. So I thought it would be nice to uh, begin a presentation with an introduction music video. And it's also the introduction to the explorative website uh, that I did in collaboration with two amazing designers, Eric Campanini and Alex Foradori. And yeah, the project is called Techno Apple Superstar. Uh, can someone maybe knock if uh, they hear the sound or not? So I can share. Desire. 
When your worth will reach a mire, what, what? what's the truth about conspire? Beyond the field of apple lies a sea of seeds. Large bells of trees appear, never ending green, revealing miles of grid formations composed of twittering extractions. Streams of toxic water fertilize the golden fruits that grow accelerated towards optimal optimization. Watch the carpet shaking and going down. Apples on synthetic colors, void of working hands. Break some ground, grab, grab, grab some pleasure in full, full measure. measure. This is a spell, a weapon in thumbs. It's calling you. It's in the grass, it's like a gown, and it's washed green. Now, uh, see, an apple is an apple, is a blot on the land. All together. An apple is an apple is a blot on the land. An apple is an apple is a blot on the land. An apple is an apple is a blot on the land. The apple rose, erect above the ground, is accusatory. Voices still around. Boil, boil, boil. Boil, boil, boil. Boil, cauldron, boil. Boil, cauldron, boil. Okay, um, so yeah, this was the sort of introduction to the project. Before sort of showing a bit around, I wanted to introduce a bit the context of the research. So uh, during the fa um, past five months, um, I made extensive research into the production and process of apple monoculture in my hometown, which is South Tyrol. It's a mountain region in the Alps in Northern Italy. And I began by interviewing farmers, scientists, went also to visit industries that pack, wash and transport the apples. And very much tried to document the landscape with drawn images, 3D scans and sounds. Uh, the region has the biggest single area producing apple trees in Europe, and it's also the leading exporter. 90% of the cultivation is based on monoculture farming. And it's not a coincidence that the region is also called the apple region. And it's always been depicted as a natural, untouched paradise, even though the reality of things um, is quite the opposite, especially if it comes to apple monoculture. Uh, in fact, the landscape is highly regulated and its infrastructure disciplines people and plants alike and creates an asymmetric interaction between precarious human labor, toxic plants and machines. So this led me to formulate the following research question. Are the apples that we buy in our supermarkets as perfect as they look? How can our Torah trouble the notion of beauty, nature, natural, and perfection that we cling to? So um, the project, it's still in progress, but yeah, let's say it's a first step towards something. Um, yeah, it could be, yeah, that could be different, but uh, it's an explorative narrative to engage, and I like to think of it as a explorative musical, as Agni suggested, which is very nice. And, the project follows the apple supply chain, so from the harvest to the consumer, and depicts a sort of dystopian landscape inside a digestive system, a machine producing false ideas of perfection. The, <clears throat> so the website focuses a lot on sound and on atmosphere, and it assembles also different representation of different industry actors towards a much configuration. So we'll now take you by the hand and show you a bit around so as a player, you can click through uh, different scenarios. In total, there are five that can be seen here. And, and every, text, every scene has a text and also a video that puts together like footage and interviews I did to give a bit more uh, discursive, uh, yeah, to, to give more information to the uh, scenario itself. So I would like now to let you listen a bit to this scenario and then I uh, will try to read you a bit more. And oh yeah, here we are 
in the first step of the supply chain, which is the farmer, and that we call the guardian bees. And here I'm going to read you a bit uh, something. I took the audio away because also this part has an audio, atmospheric audio, but maybe it's better if I read it out loud. So it's, uh, yeah, it's maybe annoying. Okay, so these are the guarding bees, chewing and swallowing. Bees of the land, you devoted your life to a god whose voice you have never heard. Fear of scarcity is the poison anesthetizing your will. Your only goal, a land to fill. Speed it out, speed it in and out and shake it all about, living in the broken open. Phosphorus and fructose pharmaceuticals are your daily lotion. Be quick and break some ground. You plow and you sow, you spray and you pray. This pass and you'll see the earth shake. The violent tools you're doomed to use shall change you to a beast that kills. Fertilizers you do to stimulate the plants towards an optimized exploit. Machinic eyes gaze down upon you from the sea below, leaving nothing in the dark. Your corpses, ecological resources, nothing but a currency. Welcome to the desolated land. Um, so yeah, the idea is that you go on in the game and so the, the monster of agro-monoculture is sort of revealed to you. The computer is talking. Oh. Do you still see things? Because, okay, I'm pixelated. <laughs> um, so we go into the... Really working. Do you hear something? Ah, because I don't hear anything. Okay, it's really sweet. Um, so here we are in the uh, in the second one in the esophagus, which is the logistics part, and um, we call them the prosperity features. So I think it's really nice to, uh, if you will be able later to watch it on the road. And then, then you go on and you are in the wizard of the jingle, which is the marketing department, which is, uh, is in the stomach. And yeah, I will let you listen to Get out. That's because we have some bad okay. arriving tomorrow. You can also you click on different things and then uh, I made some posters that are sort of uh, taken from um, different uh, advertisements, also from my region, and I changed them. And yeah, then you can go on, and there is the. Uh, we're in the. Oops. In the scientific community, where you have, um, yeah, the scientists racing to design the perfect apple. I will show you also this part. Last part, um, it's a music video. No, it's actually a song, it's not a video. And it sort of closes, uh, should close the whole experience. Um, can you can hear? Ladies and gentlemen, the lights are off. I will show you the extraordinary standard. Hey, I'm one. Travel through every nation. Hmm? I am Follow me. The fruit of fortune. I am pleasure. Delicious storm. And I am guilt. Connecting your Sweet. tongues with my crunch. Control. Culture of abuse and extinction. Being over and over 
again adapted to definitions to fit into your fantasy. It's making you blue. It's making you sick. Negotiating ownership. Widely grown, widely known, widely loved by everyone. Evidence. Invariants view varieties voraciously with vigor. I am one, and I am I'm just poison. I am medicine. I'm just poison. Like nighttime is just daytime with a blindfold. I am beauty and I am shit. So thick and so firm it stays tall. Hallelujah, that's perfection. Indoor apples fertilized by your own excrement. Hallelujah. That's perfection. Shrine of your collective stupidity. Now, go grab your suit and buy some fruits. Consume this worldwide hyper spectacle. It's all just for you. Do I still turn you on? Do you know that in the past 15 years, the number of people searching for delicious things has tripled according to Google? I am one, and I am many. I am pleasure, and I am guilt. Sweet, and in control. I am evil, I am good. I am the sin you can't refuse. I am medicine, I am just poison. Like night times, the state of the blind. I am music. Like, yeah, I think can I don't hear you. Can someone maybe talk? I don't we can hear you fine. Maybe I need to go out and come in again. Can you hear us, Bianca? No, no, someone should go. <laughs> uh, okay, I cannot hear you. Cool, <laughs> I'm alone. Uh, <laughs> Hello. You're not alone. Oh. We are with you. <laughs> anyway, I just want to say there. one thing. Oh. The light is coming as well in New Zealand. Hello. <laughs> what a fabulous way to end. We are all alone <laughs> on Zoom in weird places. But thank you so much for an amazing series of presentations. Um, absolutely mind-blowing and it's so wonderful to see it all put together like this uh i just wanted to say really quickly you know i feel like i've learned a lot from all of you here like and all from all the lecturers and tutors in fact we've got we've got a couple here jen wallace and um savio mendic have come to watch the final um uh, presentations but I feel like everyone's rejuvenated my understanding and passion for horror so I've, I've really enjoyed this experience but I feel like the the tremendous work of this cohort has really clarified the contemporary significance of horror in relation to our current modes of life and all of these projects represent like the cohort's collaborative effort to build 
a collective understanding of what horror can do and represents you know what current values might be at stake so really well done everybody well done to all the researchers thank you to the amazing uh, dr nelly ben hyun and the fabulous victoria adams and all the extended family of the university of the underground whose amazing efforts lie in building a not so monstrous and horrific future so thank you so much everybody Woohoo! Yay! Bravo! <laughs>